Good morning and welcome to Brea Congregational Church. Yesterday marks the one year anniversary of closing our church doors. So in our service today, we will reflect on all that we have learned and all that we have lost and most importantly, the places where divine love has emerged. I am grateful that you have decided to join us in worship. And I hope that you know that you are welcome, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. Let us worship together. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Dave Teese and I'll be your liturgist today and very happy to join you during this season of Lent. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Coursing through all the complexities of life, the grace of God is a constant companion. A, a blessing, blessing that, that is bestowed, bestowed not earned. earned. A declaration of inherent worth. A, a divine, divine confidence, confidence in, in human potential. potential. Let all the earth breathe a sigh of relief. All, all striving can cease. God's grace is steadfast and forever. Good morning, Brea young people. How are you doing this Sunday morning? I'm sure happy that you're here. How many of you have a dedicated workspace during this pandemic? Maybe you have a desk or a part of the kitchen table that you always work at. I'm wondering if on your desk, you have anything other than the stuff that you're working on. Well, on my desk, I keep a few important things. I keep this small little candle. It's in the shape of an elephant, which is my favorite animal. And if I ever feel like I need to take a break, just take a moment, sometimes I will light this candle to remind myself of the light in the world. I also keep this small little Jesus figurine. Uh, he even bobbles along, you can tell, uh, to the movement of my desk. I keep him there to remind me to laugh and that it's okay to find joy in my faith. I keep this little Buddha on my desk because a dear friend gave it to me, but also because it reminds me how important people all over the world, no matter what their religion, their race, their gender, or where they come from, they're important, they matter. Lastly, I have this little photo of my grandmother sitting on my desk to remind me of the people who I love and those who have loved me along the way. And I think when I can remember that I'm loved, I feel like I can do any hard task before me. Of course, all of these things, they're just symbols. I don't literally have Jesus or the Buddha or even my grandmother sitting on my desk, even though I'd be okay with that. But I am grateful for these small little reminders that those things and those people are present. In our scripture lesson this morning, there is a verse that is very well known. It's John 3:16, and it reads, God so loved the world as to give the only begotten one that whoever believes may not die but have eternal life. It's been said that this little verse is a small reminder of the gospel as a whole. If you were to boil down the entire Bible into one verse, the gist would be that God loves the world so much. I hope that as you go into this week, you can remember that. God loves the world. God loves you and create whatever reminders you need in your life to keep that in the forefront. Will you pray with me? God, we give thanks for your love. We know that your unconditional and ever-present love inspires us to love one another and that you are ever-present in all that we do and say and all that we are. 
we give thanks for our young people in our community. May they be reminded of how loved they are. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Chosen One must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in the Chosen One might have eternal life. Yes, God so loved the world as to give the only begotten One, that whoever believes may not die, but have eternal life. God sent the only begotten into the world not to condemn the world, but that through the only begotten, the world might be saved. Whoever believes in the only begotten avoids judgment, but whoever doesn't believe it's, is judged already for not believing in the name of the only begotten of God. On these grounds is sentence pronounced. That though the light came into the world, People showed they preferred darkness to the light, because their deeds were evil. Indeed, people who do wrong hate the light and avoid it, for fear their actions will be exposed. But people who live by the truth come out into the light, so that it may be plainly seen that what they do is done in God. One year ago, we gathered together to worship and pray. We gathered vaguely aware of the changes and fears happening around us. We gathered as carefully as we could, clinging to our usual ways of being together, ignorant of the swiftness of change, ignorant of the fragility of our lives. One year ago, pandemic swept across the globe a little could we have imagined what would change. 
how fast it would change, how strange it would feel, and just how long it would go on. One year on. Today, it seems important to pause, to give space, to notice not only where we have come from, but where we are and where we are going. We pause to name our losses and griefs. We pause to acknowledge our anger and fatigue and frustration and fear. We pause to remember what is missing, who is missing, what has been altered and the things we still long for. We pause to name the lessons we have learned, the new skills, values, and abilities that have come with adaptability. We pause to look around, to be reminded of what is most precious, the values that have recovered, the spaces we have found anew, the reminders of what really matters most in this life. We are reminded how far we have come by walking in faith. Through our tired trudging and our cheeks still damp with tears, we catch a glimpse of God's presence, God's love, God's hope. And so today we pause to catch our breath, to rest a moment before continuing on the journey. And so together, each in our own homes, we take a collective breath. I mean it, take a breath. Breathe in peace and breathe out love. My friends, a year of this COVID life is heavy. There have been so many things we have gained along the way. We have perhaps gained more time at home. We have perhaps, like our young friend Andy has reminded us, gained the ability to get a snack during school without being a disruption. We have certainly gained an innate knowledge that the church is not just some building over there on 300 East Imperial Highway, but rather it is all of us. We've gained the knowledge that worship can happen when we are far apart. We have truly gained so much along the way, but it has come with a lot of heartache and challenge a lot of pain and a lot of uncertainty. We have given up physical touch, hugs, handshakes, that hand on the shoulder when things are tough. We've given up travel and seeing new things and family who lives far away. We've given up singing together and worshiping in person We've lost loved ones along the way. Tina, Bill, Barbara, Lori, and others. And we know that even in this moment, although hope looms for us, that there are still many hurdles we will have to cross together. And so today, today we breathe, we acknowledge, we continue to be aware of the good and the bad that this year has brought us. We rely on new ways of supporting our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. We rely on new spiritual practices, new ways of encountering God, new ways of connecting with those that we love. And we also remember some of those old ways, some of those old things that we want to hold on to, that we can't wait to give hugs, we can't wait to sing, 
We can't wait to be in our beloved sanctuary. And for many of us, one of those old things that has sustained us throughout is turning to our scripture. And in our passage today that Dave read for us, we have what is perhaps the most famous Bible passage ever quoted, John 3.16. You see John 3.16 on billboards, on the bottom of fast food cups, on bumper stickers, and on jewelry. I think I've told this story before, but when I was young, I had very little biblical literacy. I visited a friend's evangelical church youth group, and they had set up this obstacle course where you went through different tasks along the way. Each of them were related somehow to the Bible or to the Christian faith. And to move on to the next part of the obstacle course, one station, we had to answer the question, what is your favorite Bible passage? Now, I was unable to come up with anything, and the only passage I could even think of was John 3.16. John 3.16, I shouted, and moved on to the next obstacle. I think even non-Christians might be able to recite this verse, which in the King's, King James translation reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Maybe it's because of its widespread popularity or maybe my continued study of the Bible, but I have to say that John 3.16 hasn't always been my favorite passage, contrary to what I said as a kid in that obstacle course. At least for me, John 3.16 has always felt like it has been used, at least, to show that the world, or maybe human beings as a whole, are undeserving of God's perfect love, but that God chooses to love us anyway. So much so that God was willing to sacrifice God's only child to show us that that love was and is real. Now, I know that love encompasses sacrifice, but I'm not a big believer that love is synonymous with sacrifice. I think our tendency to equate the two has done a lot of damage. It has justified abuse. It has given us unhealthy models of love. And this idea that love equals sacrifice is just not the healthiest or the most fulfilling way to look at love, at least for me. But as I alluded to earlier in our time for all ages, Martin Luther was of the mind that John 3.16 was the gospel in a nutshell. And so why is that? Why is it that John 3.16 is probably the most popular Bible passage in our current time when, well, frankly, if I'm being honest, <laughs> I think there are a lot of other passages that are more beautiful, more poetic, more engaging, more, and speak more to our faith as Christians in today's world. And so on further review, <laughs> I think any good preacher, or probably any good person for that matter, is able to admit when they're wrong. I think it's possible that I have gotten John 3.16 wrong all these years, probably even in that obstacle course. I think the emphasis of the passage upon sacrifice that God is making to send Jesus to earth isn't necessarily the full picture of this excerpt. What if this passage actually describes to us a love so great that God wanted to add more love to the world, not sacrificing anything along the way? 
what if Jesus coming to earth wasn't a sacrifice at all on God's account, but rather a way that God saw love being multiplied by Jesus's life here on earth? But we hear that second part of this passage. In our translation that Dave read earlier, it says, everyone who believes in the chosen one might have eternal life. What if God is not equating sacrifice to love, but rather equating life to love? That God chooses life and life abundantly in every single part of creation. That war and destruction and hate and death in itself are inherently opposite to what God chooses for us. It is because of this belief I hold that God loves us and God wills life for us that I can never imagine a scenario where God would willingly create a global pandemic, where God would want two and a half million people to die from this disease. But what I can conceptualize is that God's love has been present all along. We have seen God's love in our connections over Zoom and over YouTube. We have seen God's love in our church drive-bys and communion to goes. We have seen it in people wearing masks and making sure that their friends and their family and even random strangers have enough. God's love has been apparent throughout this pandemic. And although there has been great sacrifice along the way, the sacrifice is not the totality of the love that exists. That amount of love that God have, has for the world I think it might be even bigger and greater than we might even be able to imagine. And so my dear church family, this year has been so very difficult, but I will say it until I am blue in the face. You have been one of the very best parts of it for me. God's love is abundantly present here in this community, and I am grateful for you. I am grateful for your willingness to grow and change and try new things in a new way. And I'm grateful for the ways that you have been willing to come together in these difficult times, making sure that no one is left out. I'm grateful for the ways that you have continued to support important ministries in our community. I'm left with this great sense of awe of all of you and all that we have accomplished in the past year. And although I know God's love is bigger than I can even imagine, if it is even a portion of the love that I have for you, it's got to be pretty big. Our dear Jessica, who I have to say has just been an unwavering presence of stability and creativity and support over the past year, has put together this montage of the past year. I hope that you enjoy it. And I hope that you see how incredible God's love is. God so loved the world that God gave us one another to journey through life together and how blessed we are because of it. Amen and blessed be.
Let's join together in a time of silent meditation, reflecting on the ways that the stories of Jesus allow us a more intimate experience in our relationship with God. Will you join me in a time of reflective singing? Will you pray with me? Loving God, in the quietude of Lent, we meditate on your choice to enter human form as the supreme symbol of Emmanuel, God is with us. We take time to reflect on the life of Jesus and his journey as the human one, a life as intimately a part of your transforming nature as a child is to a parent. Through Jesus, you imagine with us and for us a sacred example of complete alignment with your holy aim, a life within divine love that comes only from consistent choices in favor of the common good. In a world that feels more and more complicated every day, we return in Lent to the space where we ask ourselves how we each can live in favor of that common good that Jesus points to so clearly. As we create the sacred space of Lenten worship this morning, we are reminded of those among us who are of special concern, and we lift up in prayer the friends and family of Susan Johnson, a former member of Mount Hope who passed on Sunday from cancer. 
We pray especially for Susan's husband, Dean, as we also reflect on the many ways that the Mount Hope family still enriches our community. We pray for Ray and Happy as Ray's mother passed recently. We pray for peace and strength for Maureen and Emma and Marcos, Alice and Edie, for the family and friends of Lori Knoll, for Ms. Bernie and her family, for Sheila and Linda, and for others who we name silently in our hearts. Loving Spirit, there are many among us who do not have the luxury of being able to meditate and reflect on Lenten themes because they are too busy looking for food, searching for work or health care, or struggling with physical or mental illness. They may even sometimes feel selfish for needing to place these concerns above the pursuit of a spiritual life. We pray for their comfort and their well-being. We pray that they may be able to experience your presence with them in the tiny moments of their lives and also in the foundation of their being, supporting and nurturing and loving them every step of their journey. May they also know how loved they are by their communities and their families. And may our work in favor of the common good join with the good works of all others who work for peace to create a world where each person has their fair share, enough to live and to know joy, to be safe and to thrive, to be freed from worry and daily concerns, in order to fully enjoy the spiritual life of creative transformation that you offer to every person in every moment. As a symbol of our desire to participate in the life of Christ as illuminated in the life of Jesus, we pray together the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Your children to embrace your
As we depart our virtual worship space, let us join in our responsive commission and blessing. Not for condemnation, but for freedom. This is the reason for God's presence among us. Deliverance from complicity with evil, liberation from structure of oppression, salvation from a life of destruction or despair. The love of Christ embodies among us that we and all the earth may truly live. In the assurance of grace that goes with us, may we go in faithful solidarity to the aliveness of God and neighbor. Yes, God so loved the world as to give the only begotten one, that whoever believes may not die, but have eternal life. Go forth, knowing that you are loved more than you might ever know and that through God, life is abundant. Amen, and go in peace.